Hello, and welcome back to the Artist Sanctuary with Whitney Morrison, where we gain clarity and inspiration as we explore the heart, mind, and the soul of being an artist. I am your host, Whitney Morrison. I am a singer, a recent alum of the Lyric Opera of Chicago's Ryan Opera Center. I'm an emerging artist, a music minister, speaker, thought leader, arts and artist advocate, and I am here to be your companion as we take this journey together toward honing our why we do what we do and allowing it to inform our lives as artists. Today, we're talking about feeling rejected, rejection, okay? And I tried to figure out, how am I going to structure this? And I think the best way is to just talk to my younger self and tell her about what I've discovered about rejection and how I am learning to allow it into my life or learning how to put it in its rightful place in my life. So... Um, Before we get into that, let us pray. And if you don't pray, that's okay, because I will. We do not know what to do, but our eyes are upon you. Amen. That was from 2 Chronicles 20 and 12. Um, Housekeeping, um, the budding artist offering grant application is open. It is open. It is open. Please apply. Please send it to people. If you don't uh, qualify, please send it to people you think would uh, be able to use it. Please apply by May 12th. Also, um, I hope to, you know, tell people more about it. This past, I don't know, a couple, two weeks have been kind of rough. So I haven't been posting so much on social media. So those that know the words of prayer, please pray much for me. Amen. Praise God. But, uh, we here and we doing it. So <laughs> without further ado, let's get into this episode. I don't know why I'm like excited <laughs> because we're talking about rejection, but Let's just talk about it, okay? Because I think, I guess I have to make peace with rejection because I see it as a fixture in this lifestyle I've chosen. So (laughs) let's just get to it. All right. The quote of the day. The anchor quote. Y'all, do y'all know I be dancing? Did y'all see me on the internet? I be dancing. Anyway. (laughs) Quote. The quote of the day. The anchor quote is a very simple, short quote, but I think it gets to the heart of the way I see rejection, especially in an artist's space. It hurts because it mattered. John Green. It hurts because it mattered. Now today, I'm going to start off with a little more of the theory and the opportunities that we can find in rejection, but I want you to just kind of keep your wits about you because we're going to kind of go with the the theory first and then we'll kind of get to the heart of it. So this is in no way to be flippant or to act like, you know, okay, well, you've been rejected. Just do this one, two, three, and bam, we done. No, (laughs) the anchor quote is what it is because it's important to know and I want to acknowledge it hurts, right? But before we get into what we can do about that hurt, I really want us to be able to see with clarity, right, that we have some really key opportunities if we would look up. Now, this one is uh, for all my people that are like me. So if you are a wunderkind, any type of prodigy or person who has not experienced much rejection, especially in the arts, This may not be for you, (laughs) but if you like me and you really win some and you lose some (laughs) and you have some, uh, crazy stories and some things you, uh, wish you could forget, then, uh, this is the episode for you. Um, now I chose 
the quote I chose because I think so often when we experience rejection, especially as artists, people try to make us feel better. You know, like, it's like, you know, oh my gosh, you know, oh, well, it's their loss and, you know, it's about them and all. And and it is, but at the end of the day, especially if your why is strong, especially if you're a singer um, or you feel very personally about your art, it can be really rough. It can take you out, you know, if you let it. But it can, the nature of that kind of rejection can be really devastating at times. And so for me, this idea of it hurts because it mattered is where I'd like to start because I just really believe if it hurts, if it bothered you, if you feel rejected, right, that you should feel that, right? Um, my boy Gay Hendricks, uh, the writer of The Big Leap, he talks about one of my favorite quotes from him is, feelings are meant to be felt. Feelings are meant to be felt. So if you're feeling rejected, go ahead and feel it. It's not going to, you know, take you out. And we're going to talk about some ways to process that and how I would talk to my younger self and some advice, some ways that I'm working through it that I hope will be helpful. Rejection is a part of this path that, that you've chosen. I know we don't, (laughs) we want to, you know, be optimistic and all of that. But I think thinking about it as par for the course, thinking about it as, you know, one of those occupational hazards (laughs) has really helped me because it's just like, okay, don't think it, you know, that's a scripture. Think it not strange when these things (laughs) come upon you. Some people not going to like you. And you can't, uh, you can't outgrow it. You know, like we was talking about with, um, Dave Chappelle and what episode was that? Ooh, CEO me one or two, you know, uh, you may not be able to outgrow it, but that's okay because rejection is not an identity. It is what I call an opportunity. The one that I don't think people go to first, but I'd like to start with is the opportunity to learn and to hone our skills. So often, receiving a rejection feels like such a hit to our ego that we have to protect ourselves by saying, oh, that's not true, or, you know, under-identifying with it. Sometimes we over-identify. Well, oh my gosh, you know, you know, I shouldn't be doing this, whatever. But I think a really good middle ground is to say, okay, especially if I've heard this more than once, what do I do with this? Is this just a taste issue that I have to deal with, but I can still, you know, do what I need to do, just not with some people? Or is it something you really need to listen to? So when I was in college, we used to do all the Nats competitions and, you know, this competition, that competition, you know, and we used to get so much feedback, which was really helpful, right? But sometimes some of that feedback would just be completely left. Like, what? Like, I think you an alto. I never got that. But, you know, people get kind of crazy stuff, right? People tell them to change their fog. They don't look right. You know, all of that kind of stuff, right? But my thing was, if I heard it once, I paid attention, but I wasn't going to change my whole game plan, you know, off of one comment. If I heard it twice, I need to pay attention and... um and really consider what it is. And if I heard it three times, then I need to really look um, look at how to change that, how to incorporate that feedback. Because we had so much of it, I had the opportunity to hear things um, a few times. But the idea that we can take time to learn and to hone our gifts when things don't go well, I think is a good place to start. Um, not in our hearts, but I think for this conversation, because it's so easy to be overly positive. I know that's, it's, it feels kind of like a sting, but, um, I don't ever want us to be in a place where we lack self-awareness and where it's not important to us to improve and to get feedback that can be helpful, you know? And so this idea of, um, study and strategy, I think is a good response. It's a good opportunity when we get these kinds of rejections to have, um, 
an opportunity to study and to re-strategize to say, okay, well, maybe, you know, this is not the, the plan for me, or this is not the route for me, or maybe I need to adjust my technique, or maybe I need to crisp up on this language or whatever it is, or do my acting, whatever. So opportunity to learn and to hone what it is that we're doing. Another opportunity, which is kind of odd, um, but another opportunity that rejection affords us is the opportunity to invest in our art. And it's kind of an odd concept, but it is very strong in Christian culture and in, um, in scripture. This idea that sacrifice and trial and tribulation brings forth a greater reward, right? And so this idea of enduring rejection, in one way, I think of it as um, as the, the muscle model, right? This idea that the more you use something, um, the more weight you have, the stronger you get, right? So there's that idea. But then there's this specific concept in scripture with King David. And this is from um, 2 Samuel 24 and 24. And it's one of my favorite scriptures these days. And this is when David gets in trouble with the census. I still don't understand why that was such an issue, but you know, we can talk about that another day. (laughs) But barring that, there's still a really valid concept here. And so David is going to offer something to God, right? He's going to sacrifice to God, which in my brain is to give in order to make something holy, right? So someone offers him when he goes to sacrifice, they offer him a place and the sacrifice for free. And you know, we love the for free. We love free 99. We love the hook up, okay? But David's response was different. To him, that wasn't a good thing to get something so important for free. That it was important to him that it cost him something. And so he says, no, I know you're offering me this place to worship for free. I know you're offering me this sacrifice for free. But I will not offer to God what costs me nothing. And with my art, I feel like it, I feel the same way. Like even in the black church, we <laughs> we talk about like certain songs people can't sing unless they've been through something, you know. Or you hear people singing and it's like, oh, this is so beautiful. And this is kind of like the shady church singers, especially. <laughs> they like, you know what? That is beautiful, but they singing that like they ain't never been through nothing. Okay, this idea that the anointing or that the the ability to move people is birthed is made more significant is made more potent by suffering by um challenge by resistance is so strong and so deep in the culture and i wonder if that has any merit for artists in general that my teacher, uh, Julia Faulkner, she goes and does master classes and she says, why is it that you sing? Why is it that you do your art? And people say, oh, I'm so good at it, you know, so that's why I do it. Or I just, um, you know, music is my favorite thing in the world and da 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 And <laughs> it's kind of funny because she's just like, bip, 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 bip. no. <laughs> but in her mind, love is the only reason to do art, that service in a way is the only reason to do it. And so to put that and not offering up what cost us nothing together, even if you don't necessarily take the literal spiritual meaning or that you don't necessarily offer a sacrifice to God or to a God, the idea that you offer your gifts. We talk about it in our, in, a, in an audition. We say, what are you offering? You know, <laughs> because it is an offering. What if we think about rejection as something that costs us something and that enriches our performance because we've been through something, right? <laughs> and I don't know, it's kind of odd. And I would love to talk to you about it kind of one-on-one, but this idea that 
that it is an investment, that that struggle somehow enriches us, somehow gives us potency, somehow gives us, um, real street cred (laughs) to actually communicate and to share something really valuable with people. I think it's something to be, um, to be considered and that when we experience these rejection events that we can consider that and say, huh, is this worth that rejection? Yes. And so it's going to cost me something and that's okay because I'm okay with not just offering up something that was free. But when I offer you this song, when I offer you this offering, it, it costs me something. And to me, that makes it holy. Sacrifice. Um, And the other, the next opportunity is sometimes for protection, right? Sometimes we don't have no business doing what we're doing. Sometimes we're not ready. Sometimes that opportunity will destroy us if we get it, right? So sometimes rejection is just protection, right? And, you know, I have my butterfly. (laughs) I got to talk about my butterflies, right? So, um, I love caterpillars, love butterflies, have a whole philosophy, whole book. I'm trying to write about it. Um, and I think about artists as butterflies, as caterpillars in that whole life cycle. And I think about young artists in particular as caterpillars, right? And... What I've done in my research or what I've learned in my research is that caterpillars are virtually defenseless, right? Their only real defense is camouflage, being poison, or um, pretending to be poison, right? Very passive, right? And so that kind of vulnerability, I think, is very much paralleled in young artists, right? We don't have a whole lot of ways to protect ourselves. We often just have to put ourselves out there, just have to put ourselves out there. And so I think of rejection as being camouflaged as at a time, right? So some species of caterpillars are not ready to eat and met, uh, and go through metamorphosis. And so literally they build like shelters <laughs> and they hide for a while. And so that these predators can look, um, can overlook them, right? Because if they saw them, they would pick them out. They would eat them. They would destroy them, right? And so I often think about, even though we need to learn from these experiences, even though these experiences can be an investment in our ultimate um, product, these experiences also can be a way of being guided and protected. And I think that is just such a beautiful idea that if people cannot see your potential, if people cannot appreciate what you have, I think about it like this, then they are not instrumental in my future at this point in time. And at at the least, but also it could be that if I worked with them, I'd never want to sing again. (laughs) You know what I mean? It could be that if we had that, um, if I had that experience, I would not be able to handle it. And so this idea of not ready doesn't mean not worthy, right? (laughs) It, those don't mean the same thing. And so, uh, this idea that, um, not being seen and being overlooked at a time can be very painful. Like I said, it hurts because it mattered, right? Uh, it can be an opportunity for us to learn and to grow, right? It could be just an opportunity for us to experience um, the negative side or the risk of putting ourselves out there. But also it could just be a blessing in disguise that these people should not see you because if they saw you, they would want to devour you. So protection is another way to think about rejection. I think the crux of this matter, though, is, like I continue to say, our relationship with ourselves and our relationship 
with our dedication and our resolve to create. What do I mean by that? Rejection, I think, offers us an opportunity to choose, right? When things are going well, it's easy to choose the path that has brought that that joy, that success, right? But I think when we're faced with rejection, we have to choose who we will be in adversity. Which is not easy to do, <laughs> obviously, because it does hurt, right? But I think for me, my relationship with rejection is based on my relationship with myself and with my art, right? This idea that I am not out here looking for a place to belong. Like <laughs> one of my friends, uh, my friend Erica Gabriel, I quoted her in the, uh, in the first episode. But she told me about uh, a gentleman she knows who's a musician and he has another job as well. But, you know, he's a musician and he was telling her, no, she was telling him about an audition she was going on. And she said, oh, yeah, I'm going and we'll see. And he said, first of all, we don't audition. I said, what? (laughs) We don't audition. We go do what we do. And then either they rock with us or they don't. Right. But this idea of like, we ain't, we ain't looking for no place to belong. Either you like me or you don't either. We're going to work together or we're not right. That I think about it this way. Rejection is about somebody else's relationship to what you do, but trying and continuing to try is about my relationship to what I do. Right. And that it's important to make a distinction and put a a good moat between the two. (laughs) Because I think of trying, putting myself out there as a type of spiritual discipline, right? That it matters whether or not I go for it. It matters whether or not I am in the ring, whether um, despite what the outcome is, right? That there is something holy <laughs> and sacred about showing up to the fight, even if you don't know whether or not you'll win. Because that goes back to this, um, this stewardship idea that the outcome is not up to me, but the management of the opportunity, the ability to show up and to try is my business and the rest of it is out of my hands. I never lose when I try. I never lose when I try. Like this idea that we lose something when we go for something and don't get it is a real myth, right? So I never lose. So I actually think about it as never going negative, that an experience that I try at can never take from me because it always gives to me like exercise, right? That I always get stronger. I always have an opportunity. And the thing is, I didn't count myself out. And so I have a stronger relationship with myself. I I am in my own corner to say, hey, they might not like you. That's their relationship with what you do. But as for your relationship, Whitney, with what you do, it is solid. And so I guess I'm just encouraging myself and you, my younger self, to be willing to fail, to show up and literally be willing to fail. Um, One of the quotes I saw was the worst part about failure uh, or like the fear of failure is worse than the actual event itself, right? This idea of avoidance of any risk, right? It's first of all, it's just, we don't, we don't get to do that (laughs) as artists. Typically you're not going to be what if you avoiding risk, right? But I think it's more about calculating the risk, right? Than mitigating it, right? What is it going to cost me to do this? Am 
my brain. It, it, it takes something to do it. But at the end of the day, if I try, I win always. But what is it going to take for me to do this? Is it going to hurt? Maybe it will. Is it going to, is it going to knock me out? Maybe it will. But is it worth it? Yeah. I mean, when I think about my why, because sometimes when I get rejected and I've dealt with a lot, I'm not getting too personal because I ain't trying to get y'all up in my business, but, but trust and believe <laughs> I got to plenty of stories. Okay. Oh, I was talking about love. Oh, my why. Right. When I tell you rejection for me can be so difficult because I don't see singing as just a career or a job or something I do because I'm good at. I feel it like a calling. And so at times to feel rejected is to feel like I don't have the opportunity to do what I'm called to do. It feels like I'm failing at what I should be good at, at what, at where I should be to bless somebody or, you know, that I'm not good enough, all of these different things. And then I realize, I think about my why. And I remember being in those church pews, like I talked about in, um, in episode two, I think, the Nobles in the Gutter. If you haven't seen that one, heard it, you should go back, right? I remember getting all that value and hearing people sing, receiving these artistic offerings, and it literally changing my life. It literally changing my mood. It literally feeling like an agent to save my soul, right? That's important stuff. And to realize that, hey, oh, I may not have gotten the opportunity to do that then or now, right? Does not erase the fact that when I got up there to sing, these people had that, that exact same experience. You know what I mean? I remember being in college and one of the teachers pulling me into his office, right? And older, older guy, I didn't even know him. I got word somewhere across campus. Hey, come see me. I went to go see him. And I had never experienced anything like this in my life. I went into his office. He closed the door. And I saw this tall man, older gentleman, really well respected. I saw him break down and cry like a baby. He said, I have never been moved like that in my whole life, you know, and I know what that's like. And so for somebody to tell me, no, I can't do this with you right here. Yeah, that hurts. But guess what? It does not compare to why I'm doing this. And that's to reach the people that I can because I know what that's like. And so that kind of, okay, yeah, it's a risk. Yeah, it may hurt. Yeah, I might not be able to do it here, but if that can't stop what I'm, what I'm here to do, not ultimately, right? And so I think of this kind of cycle of trying, <laughs> rejection and trying, and some, some successes, sure, right? But this idea of kind of being tor torn down and then built up, I think about it as part of the discipline of being an artist. It's just par for the course and it's worth it. What I think about, if I have to get torn down a hundred times, a thousand times and have to build myself up, it'd be worth it to have another person have that kind of experience. But there is a discipline to the rebuilding. And I think that's what I really want to talk about now, what I want to kind of finish with. Oh, and this is probably my favorite concept from the butterflies. We talked about how these caterpillars are very vulnerable. And as young artists, we are. People can say things to us and have really no thought about how it can affect us. They talk about your, what you look like. They talk about how, uh, what you sound like, what your natural voice is like, what your training is like. You know, they talk about everything, your languages, and let's not even get into the biases, right? You know, there's just so much mess at times we have to weed through in this conversation about rejection. And so for me, it 
to counter all of that, I have to take on another discipline, which is to build and to rebuild myself, right? As a, another spiritual discipline, in order to try, I have to rebuild myself. And so caterpillars, right? They are very vulnerable creatures, but if they can get to a certain level of maturity, they become a lot less vulnerable because they get wings. And so they actually have a way to escape at that point, right? But before they get to that part or get to that point, the caterpillar's only defense, like we said, was to hide, camouflage, to be poison, which is more so for the species. Because if you get eight and you poison, you don't not get eight. The thing just die. You know what I mean? Um, or to pretend to be poison, right? But the way, those are kind of like the defenses, right? But the active way to get to butterfly, <laughs> right? To get to that better place, to get to the place where you can reproduce, to get to the place where you're fully actualized is to eat. That's literally their whole job. They don't hunt, they don't gather, they eat. They eat. And I think about eating as nourishing and rebuilding ourselves. And so what is eating, right? If the caterpillar eats, right? It eats leaves. Well, what does the young artist eat? The art, young artist eats or consumes anything that makes it bigger. Anything that allow, that brings it to passion, right? This idea for me, Eating is anything that builds me up, that makes me more well, that makes me more enthusiastic about singing, that makes me more creative. So I like to listen to, uh, I have a whole list, right, of eating activities. Some of them are just simple self-care, you know, eating well, exercise, walking, things that do it for me, that allow me to be more creative, especially after I've taken a hit, right? But I love to listen to like Leandria Johnson. Every time I listen to that woman sing, I am inspired, right? And so different things of that sort, finding what, what does it for you is the equivalent of eating. And when these caterpillars eat, right? They don't just eat one time and then they're ready to go on the other side of the leaf, ready to become butterflies. They literally eat until they burst, right? That's, they, they eat till they burst, they puff back up and they do this several times until they're big enough, until they're strong enough to go through metamorphosis. And so I guess that's my admonition to us as we deal with rejection to know that there is a cycle to it. There is a system to it. And as we get knocked down, it hurts because it matters. As we get knocked down, for us to not think it's a strange thing and not be confused about it coming to us and not be confused about who we are and what we need to do and that we build ourselves up, that we consume as much inspiration, as much creativity, as much um, learning, as much um, strength as we can to make it to, um, to the next try. <laughs> Yeah, friends. So yeah, it hurts because it mattered. But my encouragement is to not think it's strange, to not be confused, but, but to be convinced and to eat till you burst with passion and then do it all over again. Because one day, even though it's not a guarantee to become a butterfly, because again, caterpillars are vulnerable and so they can be picked off. You see how many people start on this path and don't make it, you know, don't continue to be the artists that they hoped to be. That's a real reality. But I believe that our best bet, even in the face of rejection, is to eat till we burst. Burst with passion, burst with creativity, burst with a knowing of why we're doing what we're doing, and um, burst with perspective to know that it's important and important enough to weather whatever storms come our way. So until next time, I hope you eat till you burst and uh, let us do our benediction. May we live in wholeness. May we give from fullness. May we create and burst with passion. <laughs>
Until next time, love y'all.